examples that are related to challenges, you know, that relate to trauma, whether it being developmental or shock or any other type, they do affect our spirituality mm. because they restrict us uh, and our modes of living and adaptation and our abilities to connect and our access to resources, they restrict all of these things. Um, and so definitely they do affect our spirituality. And so I want to find a scientific way to transition uh, so that we can have an organized framework of integrating spirituality into um, a development framework. So it's not just for healing. Of course, all of these notions apply in cases of healing but they also apply in cases of simple growth. Any person who's willing to grow, who want to develop their character, who want to you know, uh, grow personally in one area or other in, in their lives. So it, it applies in that situation as well. So this is one of the questions that I'm researching now. I'm working yeah, these, on that. These are, these are very, very, oh wow, that's amazing. Um, and it's always, I mean, I, I always, enjoy talking to fellow coaches like um you know my sort of uh, very non uh what's the word non-empirical statement on this is that you know we vibrate at a different level and it's yeah. just it's it's always uh yeah it's always a different it's very uh, enjoyable but um what was i going to say um so how how does one go about um I and mean, what has there been any research done in this area? I know there's some, there's a considerable amount of research that's being done, has been done already vis-a-vis <clears throat> -vis, uh, Buddhist Buddhism and, and med you know, Buddhist meditators and so forth and what sort of um, nuns and things like that. Yeah, you know, the, 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 Oops, I would say the challenge with such methods is that they can, they can, reverberate badly uh, in cases of trauma right so they can reverberate badly in cases of trauma yeah yeah because okay. maybe I, i'm know, not sure i understand what, what, what do you mean they can reverberate badly uh, so if you could unpack that a bit, yeah. they can have um, the opposite effect the one desired no, I can. see. Right, right. So if there's trauma, trauma and then... They can actually uh, cause the person to focus Sorry, I couldn't uh, hear you for a second. There. That I didn't hear you for a moment there. Um, no? no, I missed you for a moment. Um, okay. What I mean by that is that they can... There's the risk of getting re-traumatized and... What is meant by that is that if you are exposed to the same experience, mm -hmm. so we're no longer talking about the event that caused the trauma in the past, the consequences of that have crystallized into your system, you know, into a certain dynamic in your system. And so you are living the trauma every day in your life. And so when we open, when we open to those fields, traumatic fields within us, without an understanding of what is going on or what the issues are uh, or without um, a safe method, you know, um, then we are risking an exposure to them that increases the trauma, that reinforces it, that's the right word, mm -hmm. instead of healing. So what I want to say is, um, you know, with certain things, mindfulness works and meditation works. With, with certain things, because it allows us to be in the moment and to accept everything, you know, that that's part of us, whether it's a positive experience or a difficult experience. And this is one of the tools that we definitely use in healing, right? But it's not a tool that you can always use. You have to know when to use it, when not to use it, and when you are using it you have to also know how much to use it you know and where to start and where to stop it's very delicate because when exposure is not conscious and when it's not controlled when it's not well studied it can have the opposite effect to the one desired that this is interesting so so I, I, am i Am I understanding you correctly? So, uh, 
so having a spiritual practice, if not done, and to add perhaps a line there, if not done under the guidance of someone who knows, he or she knows what's happening for this person psychically, I mean, in terms of their psychology vis-a-vis -vis past traumas, it, that could potentially, rather than instead of doing good, it could potentially do more harm. If it, it, I'm, I'm, well, I'm yes and no. You're mm -hmm. you're getting you're getting close. I'm getting out. But <laughs> not quite there yet. Nearly. Allah wants it. We have to know what is meant here by spiritual practice, right? Because mm. uh, meditation is a spiritual practice. But for example, you have the right. Islamic prayer, which is a completely different, I would say, right. form of, of uh, spiritual practice as well, right? right. So not all spiritual practices are the same. So I cannot say that all spiritual practices are not safe if someone is uh, in a certain uh, state in their life. Cannot say that. Uh, but at the same time, we cannot say that go ahead and do anything, you know, because just because it fits under the umbrella of spirituality that it's definitely going to do you good. No. Right, mm -hmm. and especially meditation itself. Mm -hmm. You're meditating, but the question is, what are you meditating on? Mm. Wow, that's fascinating. I, this is this is new territory for me. This is amazing. So, um, which yeah. doesn't surprise me. I mean, uh, what do I know? But uh, uh, so, so much. So, so, let, so let's say my. No, I was just going to say, <clears throat> say, take for instance mindfulness practice right which is increasingly like that's it's practiced more and more and and, and so corporations and things like that i know someone like sam harris right who's a who's an avowed uh, atheist and you know one of the proponents of new atheism he he even has his own app and so th these practices could potentially do more harm than than um wow how about yoga? And I'm, this is very, I, 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 I never considered this before, so thank, this is, thank you so much for, for sharing this. Uh, this yeah. is really opening up my horizons considerably. So would you, what would you say about something like yoga, for instance? Right. So just as a reminder here, I'm not generalizing, right? Okay. Um, but it is something that is worth saying that not mm. all spiritual practices are suitable to anybody. Mm -hmm. um, for some people, they may work like a charm. For other people who are in a specific state or have specific needs, um, they mm -hmm. may not work or they may even cause more damage. And yoga also applies. Mm -hmm. It applies to yoga as well. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I have done research on, on, these, uh, on these elements. They have been part of my research in the past three years, mm -hmm. um, both theoretical and experimental. Research. I'm sorry, someone's calling. Let me just hang up there. Uh, I apologize. One second. Okay. Uh, I thought this so would happen. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, when it comes to yoga, uh, it's the deeper the deeper are the issue the deeper the issues, the more ingrained they are. You know, um, the harder it is for yoga to be sufficient in healing them. So if we take yoga as a healing tool, right? Because many people do that. It depends. Again, it depends. So if you take some, for example, somebody who has complex trauma and uh, who has, for example, developmental trauma, by which we mean trauma that uh, happened in the earlier stages of development, you know, when, when someone was a child, um, and their basic needs, so the basic needs of a human being were not met properly causing dysfunction in certain systems you know in, in in the in the body and so in such cases it becomes harder for yoga to contribute um, to the healing and sometimes it can have a counter effect and again it depends of course not just what type of yoga you are doing because there are different types of yoga there are types that are more aggressive than others but then there's also the question is the person you are practicing with your practitioner or your leader um, do they have an understanding of your situation and do they understand 
how to read the body from that vantage point, from the vantage point of trauma, right? Um, because sometimes what can happen is that you can be tapping through yoga into areas in the body that have been accumulating for so long and that have been stuck in a certain state for so long that once you tap into those, the body gets out of control. Right. And some practitioners would tell you that's okay, that's a good sign, it's a right, sign that your body right. is responding. Right, right. Which it can be, at the same time, it can be re traumatizing to the body. Why? Because you have allowed, let's say, the lava to come out of that volcano without a consciousness of why it's there and without any knowledge or tools at hand to contain it and give it a new shape. So, how do you resolve trauma? You resolve trauma when you when you access its presence in the body in a way such that you can create a new framework for the experience and a new meaning so it no longer becomes a trauma. But if you just allow for access without having the tools or the knowledge or the consciousness or the understanding of what is going on and what to do with it, then you're just reinforcing the trauma. And whether that is being done at the spiritual level or the psychological level, uh, which some psychotherapy techniques do also, by the way, or at the level of the body through yoga, it's the same thing. The question is, who are you working with? What state are they in? Um, how much are you tapping into and are you prepared? You, you mentioned, uh, you, you, you said, which some psychos, uh, I'm not going to remember, my, but you, so, so some psychotherapists, if I'm, if I'm understand correctly, some psychotherapists inadvertently uh, uh, sort of awaken, uh, yeah. not awaken, sort of bring up to the surface certain traumas without necessarily knowing what to do with them then, or is, is yeah. am I understanding you correctly? Yeah. Yeah, it could happen. Wow. wow, this is this is so profound. So if, if we take the example, um, I mean, to take yoga as an example, something that I've practiced for some time, and, and I sort of, and I should stop doing this and beginning to realize now, I, I will very typically say, I believe everyone should practice yoga. I think it's like a gift, which I really believe. I think, I don't, you know, maybe I should change this belief a little bit or modify it. I think it's like a gift from God and it's like medicine that everyone can benefit from. And maybe, and maybe that blanket statement is, isn't so wise because <clears throat> taking the example of yoga, if you were working with someone who practices yoga and uh, I remember, you know, a few years ago uh, uh, after um, in one of the yoga classes, um, uh, there was some, we we're doing some, um, so my brain's really not functioning how it should be, but uh, we we're doing some hip opening um, asanas and um, I felt like crying at one point and I said, uh, like, re I really felt like bawling my eyes out and I didn't because uh, I'm a guy, I'm a stereotypical guy, of course, but uh, not so stereotypical, but uh, in that sense. So I said to the teacher afterwards, when the class was over, my experience, and she said, oh, that's not uncommon, given what, but that was it. That's all the insight she had. And this is someone who's been doing this for like 20 plus years. And I was like, well, yeah. that wasn't really helpful. And, um, and it was like, a, I mean, as far as I know, I, I don't, I mean, I don't know consciously if, if that had any <clears throat> further yeah. negative implications, but that did sit with me a little bit. I was like, well, that was a really powerful emotion. I don't know what, what to do with that, where to place it. And because they say, right, that we, we store our emotions in our, in, our, in our hips, is that right? Or a lot of, not emotions, but... Uh, All of the body, actually. In the, in the entire body, right, in the, the entire, entire body. body yeah. right? It just depends what type of emotion. Mm. And to what need it's related, right? So, for mm. example, responsibility sits on the shoulders, connection is in the gut. Mm. So you have different places in the body that... And in the hips would be sexual trauma, would it? Am I, am I, no, not necessarily. Not necessarily, it's about love and connection. Oh. And sexuality falls under that as well. Mm. Wow, because I, I, have, I have actually some sexual trauma in my past. I wonder, I mean, I, anyway, I'm not turning this into, it. This is a, I'm, not, I'm not asking you to coach me, but, but it's, 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 interesting. it's interesting to think. Wow, yeah. this, is, this is profound. Wow, yeah. amazing. And the stomach deals with anxiety, all right. different levels of anxiety, right? right, 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 right. Uh, from the 
the healthy to the most dangerous. Um, mm. The chess mm. is about openness to the world. Mm. Mm. Right? That's why sadness sits in the chest. Mm. Mm. Sadness versus hope. Mm. So certain experiences relate to certain emotions, relate to certain needs, and they relate to certain parts in the body. Mm. Well, so I'm this is something I actually didn't want to be thinking about, so I keep going back to this bottle. Um, wow, this is this is incredible. I mean, the, we we should just do do a video conversation on on this itself. I mean, there's so much there that I I mean, all that stuff. I mean, I, I know some of these things very superficially and a little intuitively, but not no definitely knowing it, the depth that that you, you know these things. Uh, this is phenomenal, and and. So when you conduct research, like uh, just for my edification, like what are, what texts are you reading? How do you go about doing this? Like what's the right. system? So that was an important question that I had to ask myself as well, mm, right? Um, right? So I went about research in a very unique way, um, the way I see it should be done, because this is a very personal and um, it's very much inward. It's not in the outside world. It's not like you bring a mathematical equation, you can test it, right? And you have the objects right there in front of you and you see if it works or not. It's the inner world. And we know that the inner world is very well hidden. Mm -hmm. Even our inner world is hidden from us until we go and explore it, right? Yeah. So the only way that did work for me was to do theoretical and experimental. And what I mean by that is experimental included two things. Uh, working with my clients. So when I work with my clients, of course, what I do is I keep my work with them within my qualifications. Uh, <laughs> but at the same time, I have in mind everything else that I'm reading about. And I am curious, you know, when I'm working with my clients, I ask them questions and I reflect on how they reacted and, you know, what worked and what did not work and what were their comments. And I take note of what is going on with my clients. The second part of my experimentation was actually me. So I took myself as the guinea pig. And what I did is the, the techniques that I had a lot of questions about or was interested in or saw, saw some potential in, I went out and tried them myself. Mm. Wow. I could have an experimental field to map to the theoretical, whatever theoretical I was reading in the books. It's amazing. Wow. You're, you're like uh, one of these traditional and these historic yogis, you know, that they, they did. Uh, this is amazing. Wow. I love yeah. it. Field. Otherwise, you yeah. don't really know what it means, right? See, yeah. that's, I think we have, the way we know things is by first principles which is knowledge that is in it to us and it, it gives us a certain frame of reference. So if you want to understand your inner world, you need to have some sort of a frame of reference. And I found that getting that from books alone was not sufficient. I mean, I get it. I get that this is what they are doing when they are doing, for example, psychotherapy, let's say, and there are like 10 different types of psychotherapy. So, they are different in within themselves but let's say we pick one of them we are working with it we understand how it works you know um but then how do you know what that actually means how do you know what it means to feel connected mm. right i bet you if you walk down the street and you just ask people do you feel connected to your body a lot of people are going to tell you, are going to be ab not able to answer the question just because they don't have a frame of reference to what that actually means. Yeah. What do you mean by connected to my body? How do I know if I am or not connected to my body? And if that person, if, if this is the answer they give you, it means they, they are not connected to their body. Yeah. Because once you are connected to your body, you would actually understand the question. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is very, very profound. Wow. Oh, God bless you. You, you are, you're very, you're very unusual. You're very, um, you're very unusual. This is, uh, we need more, <clears throat> the world needs more people like you. I'm genuinely, the world needs more people who, who really think in a holistic way about these things, um, you know, and, and have, have, you know, a rich framework within which to, to think through things. Um, Wow, this is amazing. One one could talk endlessly about this this topic. Um, 
Yeah, I'm happy to have another call about this. Let's do it. Let's really do it. This is so, so important because, I mean, the level at which you're talking is, is a very, very high level. I mean, I just know this off the bat because, and you know this to be the case, and I know this immediately. It's at a very high level, and um, <clears throat> this, uh, people don't really talk at this level. The, the, the sort of, a lot of the self-help stuff, which is very useful, I personally have benefited a lot from it. Yeah. And I owe, I owe a lot of these people a lot. At the same time, it's still very often very superficial. And maybe necessarily so, one might say, right? It's, um, I, I, and I wonder if, you know, to what extent is it because they're trying to reach a wider audience? Is, is it because of that? And I, I think partly that's re the reason why. But also I wonder if, if many of these big names, some of these big names, um, are not even maybe fully equipped to deal with things on a much more uh, uh, on a deeper level, right? Um, yeah. Uh, my, my intuition is, is probably, you know, do you share my intuition that it's probably the case that they're not even equipped, right? Uh, not always, but I, I think in some instances. Oh, wow. Well, this is amazing. So, um, so we'll like pause for, you know, we'll, uh, like we we'll pretend we're just starting. Uh, All right. And um, yeah, so the question of masculinity and femininity, I mean, we'll just have, you know, be, just be sort of free flowing back and forth. Uh, my, um, the person I'm really inspired by uh, uh, in, with regard to podcasts and things like that is Joe Rogan. Um, you know, do you know Joe Rogan, the comedian? Uh, check out his, uh, Joe Rogan, he's, he's a comedian, but that's his main profession. But uh, he also has, um, I think, the world's most downloaded podcast. Um, he interviews all sorts of fascinating people, and he will often have conversations that last three hours. I mean, we're not going to have a three-hour conversation, but, <laughs> you know, and, and it's just free-flowing. And it, he, I mean, I think he's, the work that he's doing in terms of spreading knowledge is amazing. Anyway, so I, I definitely take inspiration from him, and it's, it's just, you know, unscripted and, and going with the flow as they say but um, um, yeah it's so, it's so good uh, to connect with you genuinely and um, you know we originally connected on, on the question on the question right of masculinity it's, there's a big question mark around this topic um, as as a man, this is something that I have had occasion to think about a lot over the years. It's something that I continue to think about a lot, uh, both myself um, <clears throat> as as a father, as a coach. Um, you know what what does it mean to be masculine, right? Versus being feminine, like. This is inherent opposition, apparently, at least on the surface. Um, is it even okay to think in those terms, right? There's a there's a type of discourse very um, seriously put, right, by serious people that um, you know to even think about the to think in these terms is problematic off the bat, you know, um, and there's complex historic reasons as to why that is the case, right? Um, as far as I understand, masculinity in and of itself is not, need not be a bad thing. Um, the, uh, from an Islamic metaphysical point of view, for example, um, God is understood as having both masculine qualities, right? God is neither masculine nor feminine, but for, for, our, for us to comprehend it, right, from an Islamic metaphysical point of view, God has both masculine qualities and feminine qualities, and, and, and those two uh, poles, as it were, create a, there's a creative tension between those and in, in creating in, in the world itself, and, and there's no getting away from the, the, the sort of the polar dimension of existence itself, right? Um, well, what's your, what's your take on, on all of this? Uh, I pick, I'd like to pick on the, one of the words you just mentioned now, polar. Mm. Um, you know, you, you um, make me think of polarity. 
which relates, in my opinion, to masculinity and femininity. Uh, back to the initial question of, well, does it actually exist, right? That's the first mm. question. Mm. Is it a concept that was made up by the human mind to cope with things or to give meaning to certain things? Um, and if that's so, then if we find another framework for meaning, then do we still need the framework of masculinity and femininity? So basically, the, the first question is, does it exist in and of itself? Or is and, it and, 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 and to that point also, some may and do very seriously argue, well, this is all part of the patriarchal sort of uh, system yeah. to even think in these terms, right? It's because men have historically until now dominated uh, mm. <clears throat> the world and, and not least of all women. And it, this is just you know, a convenient way of structuring things so they can maintain their dominance, right? Right. But, you know, I find this argument to be self-defeating uh, mm -hmm. because if you want to go back and study history and how, you know, in history, uh, certain roles affected other roles in society, mm -hmm. you are accepting the fact that, you know, in older civilizations, masculine and feminine were never the same. And so, okay, let's say that it's even a question of nurture and not one of nature, right? Because that's the question you are tackling at the moment. So even if we do assume that that's the case, then let's ask ourselves, you know, so nurture, if there were no masculinity and femininity to begin with, <laughs> then on what basis did older civilizations nurture the masculine to be dominant and the feminine to be less dominant. Mm -hmm. There is a premise here, right? We have to ask ourselves, so where did this come from? Mm -hmm. Even if it's a question of nurture, why wasn't it the opposite? There's a certain pattern in history and it's the same pattern. It has been the same pattern across the globe. No matter how old or new the civilization is, it's always, there's always a pattern that the masculine was the one in the past linked to leadership responsibility and the feminine is was the one linked to you know less let's say less aggressive i would say uh, uh, responsibilities not that the woman didn't have responsibilities but they were less aggressive they were more inward than outward right uh, because the societies back then were more integrated in nature and so the man's work by nature had to be more aggressive and so why didn't the opposite happen well so 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 to that point what you just uh, what you just pre uh, presented right um, a, a sort of uh, a liberal critique would be right and, and I'm not saying that I, I don't adopt this critique but the, the, the liberal critique of what you just stated would be to say, well, there is no such thing as nature. It's all, <clears throat> uh, these things are, uh, these things are socially um, decided, mm -hmm. right? And, and they're sort of somewhat, uh, uh, um, they're, they're decided not because this is how things are, it's because this is how we decide things will be. And, and there's a power dimension, and uh, uh, um, you know, and, and it all goes down to power. Uh, it go, all goes back to power, and because men, the the, the biologically male what, uh, of the species, wanted to and continues to want to dominate, therefore they 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 talk in these terms. But yeah. um, so, how would you respond to that? Um, right. So um, my answer is twofold. The first point. I would raise is um, if it was decided by somebody, okay? Um, we know, even scientifically, we know that when a certain theory has a high has a high probability to be wrong or to fail, it's very easy to come up with counterexamples. As a matter of fact, you need like one counterexample to disprove a theory like 100%. But what does this show us? It shows us that there is a certain order in nature 
in the universe, in the world. Whether we're talking about people or, or nature or whatever it is, there's a certain order that when something doesn't work, it doesn't live long, mm -hmm. right? When a system doesn't work, it doesn't live long. So I find it really uh, intriguing that this system of the masculine and the feminine, the way it has been defined in the past, it lived throughout all the civilizations that are documented that we have access to. Mm -hmm. So to come now and say they have all been like brainwashed or manipulated, or it's just because the first human being made a decision that this is going to be masculine, this is going to be feminine, it's just not logical. Because remember also that these civilizations were not connected like the world is today, right? They were separate. Sometimes they lived for thousands of years without having like a connection or without, without having contact with each other, depending if they were living on different continents. And so still the same order applied everywhere and not only applied, it survived. So those who make this critique of nature versus nurture usually are the same ones who vouch for the survival of the fittest, right? That the fittest is the one that survives. The one that has the, be the better qualities is the one most likely to survive. And so why did this concept of the masculine and the feminine survive all these thousands of years of civilizations that were not even connected to each other and could therefore not influence one another if it wasn't the fittest one for the human beings to survive. And we have to take this one into consideration. And the second point that I would raise is, um, I find that there is a certain oneness in the world in terms of the way it is structured. Not oneness is in, in, in that everything blends into one, into an absolute one, losing its uniqueness. No, not that type of oneness, but in, in the way it's structured. So for example, we know that from the atoms to the molecules that form everything in and outside of us, there's the plus and the minus, and they attract. And without this basic law, we would not have anything. Nothing would hold up, right? And so if you look in nature, you see the same model being repeated everywhere. Animals, there's the masculine and the feminine, if we're talking genders, for example, right? Um, even in languages. We need to ask ourselves, why in languages, especially the ones that have, um, that have survived the test of time, the old languages, right? That, you know, in the old days, languages had wisdom in them. They weren't just words, you know, each word in the language had so much meaning in it and they reflected the complexity of the human intellect. So they weren't just tools to say something, they were tools to think. And so in those languages, you would see that certain things are given um, the masculine uh, attribute and other things are given the feminine attribute. So was that completely random? How come, you know? Um, and then there's the personal experience as well. There's something about even those people who say that there is no masculine, no feminine. When you long for a certain connection, when you long to be cared for, mm -hmm. right? How does it make you feel? It's not the same feeling that you have when you are obeying authority it's a completely different experience inside yourself. Can, can you say a little bit more, uh, can you um, unpack that a little bit? Um, I, I, understand it in, uh, I understand it intuitively what you're saying. Uh -huh. Yeah, so um, I think experience, the realm of experience is understudied and underestimated scientifically speaking, right? Um, because we all know that if we don't see it, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Now we're getting to study emotions, understand energy that for thousands of years we weren't able to see. Only now we can see energy with advanced machines. 
But before that, before this, you know, advancement in technology happened in history, they never were able to really touch energy, but they experienced it. And so they knew it existed. And today, mm -hmm. this thing that people have been experiencing since the beginning of time is understood to have a structure, you know, mm -hmm. um, different points of energy in our body have different functions, different roles, they serve us in different ways. And so these things are real. And so our experience of things should be, in my opinion, one of the scientific inputs to understand things in life. It mm -hmm. means something. how you experience something is meaningful, very meaningful, mm -hmm. right? And so my question is, how do people, including those who vouch for nurture over nature, mm -hmm. how do they experience the feminine qualities and the masculine qualities? Do they experience them exactly the same way? And I think here, the argument, uh, I would say, is based on a difference in, in premises and assumptions. You know, if you how, how how do people how do can you give me an, a, a real world um, like an illustration of how someone experiences the masculine and feminine in, in day to day life? What what do you mean by that? Again, right. intuitively, I mean, I I I, I mean, I I, I can yeah. you know I can sense what you mean, but uh, yeah. by way of example. So, in general, usually you see the the masculine qualities. Uh, are they cause or they require in their experience contraction mm. and the feminine quality is cause and require expansion right so let's name a few feminine qualities like love right nurture so really caring for someone in a way that facilitates their growth. This is nurture, love, patience, okay? All of these qualities, when we talk about openness, expansion, when we feel that our world is big, we have hope, all of these things, they are connected to the feminine realm. And the masculine, for example, authority, leadership, let's go back like thousands of years in time right hunting let's go back to the most primitive definition of masculine and feminine okay uh the males they used to hunt for food so they had to face the danger the stress you know um they had to be always cautious and and um alert so that they survive they don't want to die right they had to face all of these things and all of these experiences have a lot of contraction in them when you're alert so even today as human being physiologically biologically that's how you function when you you have a perceived threat whether it's real or not perceived right you're contracted everything in you contracts. physiologically one contracts right Once the um, chest tightens right exactly. right the, the, this focus like the, the focus narrows down right? right when you're defending yourself right even in martial arts, for example, contraction, a lot of focus. Um, you want all of your muscles to be alert, ready, waiting for the command, you know, whether it's your hand or your foot or your back or whatever it is. Let's look at the feminine qualities. Again, going back to the most basic definition, you know, in the old days of what makes something feminine. First of all, having, having children, getting pregnant, giving birth, right? There's a lot of giving, a lot of giving. Basically, the baby is, you know, taking everything from the mother for nine months, everything. Completely dependent on her, 100%. That's a lot of giving. And then in birth, very painful. A lot of patience is required. But again, is it for a cost? No, it's free. The mother loves her child. She's more than happy to go through labor, right? And then you have raising the child, educating the child, paying attention. You know, you have to be affectionate. You have to have love, compassion, empathy. You have to understand the child. You can't just be punishing them all the time. We know this from 
modern sciences in psychology and education that if, if the only way you deal with your child is through punishment, they're going to end up really traumatized and dysfunctional, right? So you need a lot of love, affection, compassion, empathy, a lot of intelligence, emotional intelligence, they call it, in raising children. So all of these qualities, even now, as I'm mentioning them one by one, if you try to sense in your body how your body is reacting to you hearing these words, it's expensive. Yeah. It's yeah. expensive, right? And so the very nature of these things is reflected in how we experience them. So this is, you can brainwash the mind, right? But you cannot brainwash the most basic biological um, processes by which your body survives and lives and grows and has been since you know the inception of the human being and so there is a very deep reality and there's a lot of meaning and information in the way we experience things you know it opens a new perspective so so, considering. so so what i'm hearing uh, th thank you for that very um very insightful um analysis um well, what I'm hearing is that uh, masculine and feminine qualities, it's not, it's not the case you know, that only men have masculine qualities, only women have feminine qualities. Although these sort of two sort of archetypal examples that you mentioned with hunting and, and giving birth, these, these, these tended to be, well, these things are changing now. The men are getting pregnant now, so is, yeah. we're taking a whole new dimension. And, uh, God, God have mercy on us. But, um, uh, so, but what I'm hearing actually is that, despite those archetypal examples, that, uh, because in your example of the mother who, who's nurturing, that mother could also be, could not be nurturing and, and be constrictive and punishing, right? So, so in other words, men can, I mean, and men love. I mean, men have, not only men, but some of the greatest poets that we know of have been men, right? Men like to write, historically, they like to write love poetry. So, so, so men can have, they can certainly cultivate this kind of poetry. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. So, so, so we have both these dimensions within us, yeah. regardless of our biology differentiate between the notion of gender and yeah. the notions of masculinity and femininity because right. these exist as concepts right they are intangible realities and that's why we refer to them as metaphysical realities right because they exist in and of themselves the concept of masculinity which is in the nature of things right everything everything that exists has a nature and the nature is part essence and part attributes okay this is like basic logic by the way so essence is what makes you you or what makes the chair a chair and attributes are things attributed to it so for example anything that you can sit on can be considered a chair, right? So it's in the essence of a chair that it is something that you sit on. It has, it has. So that's chairs, why right. if I show you this laptop and I tell you it's a chair, you laugh at me, right? Un unless I galvanize it and turn it into something I can sit on, right? Um, right, but then right. you have adapted it to become something else. Right, right, right. right. Okay. And so when it comes to the shape, the material, the color, the weight, all of these things, they are attributes. So you can change the attributes, but as long as the essence is the same, the object is recognized as the same object, right? So, so and, what, yeah. So I was just going to say, um, again, I mean, I, the, the only reason why I mentioned this is because this is, a, a, you know, quite, a, a, you know, as part of the, uh, part of the discourse, right, that we, that we hear, um, not least of all at a place like Colombia, right, and it's, um, it's quite common that there's no, nothing has an essential nature, right, everything, and, and I only mention this because you already touched upon this, but to, to maybe 
to hear some more of your responses on this. That um, it's, however, you know, someone like Judith Butler, right, the, the philosopher and, and gender theorist, she'll say that, you know, even gender itself is socially constructed and nothing, nothing has an essential quality as such. It's just how, how we use it by, because of social convention. And someone like um, Jordan Peterson, who would probably be on the other end of the spectrum, this would be Judith Butler, uh, would say, well, what, you know, he doesn't accept that, you know, he, he will speak in very similar terms that, that you're enunciating, that we see uh, uh, in terms of biology, right, uh, in terms of I mean, what may be classed as fundamental makeup, right, that, that, that there are certain things that are observable in science, uh, through science. Now, and this discourse gets problematic a little bit because many people say, um, you know, science itself, it, 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 it's questionable. Not everything is, is objective per se. There's issues of power and, and things like that. And that's a, that's a whole other can of worms that I don't necessarily want to go into. But how, how would you respond to someone like Judith Butler? Um, who says, again, you know, gen, gender, gender in itself does not exist. It's a social construct. Right. Um, how, how would he explain the biological differences? Um, so, so she says that, uh, I, I don't know Judith Butler well enough, but the little that I do know, she says that bio, um, the biological, I, I don't, that's, I think that's an important uh, question. And this is where Jordan Peterson criticizes Judith Butler in yeah. saying that, I mean, she says that she, I mean, this is the problem with postmodern theory, like taken to its nth degree, I mean, taken, taken to its logical conclusion, which I think people like Judith Butler are doing, while, you know, understand they're doing yeah. great work elsewhere. Um, that they, they argue that even biology as we understand it, I mean, so I guess what they're saying is <clears throat> science, but, you know, biology being a part of modern science as such, um, is not separable from the sort of social uh, framework within which it's imagined. And it's a, it's a deeply uh, power-riven world uh, wherein there are patriarchal sort of male-dominated uh, tropes and those male-dominated tropes get read into into and through scientific yeah. Uh, yeah. observations yeah. themselves. Mm -hmm. I see. I see the point that she tries to make, and I I agree with that point. Right? That um, I think it's a fact that any branch of knowledge that is humanly constructed is, to a certain degree, reflecting mm -hmm. the intellectual framework that manufactured it. Right? So, for example. Um, if, if, and this is, this is a common phenomenon, by the way, so I'm going to use it as an example. I think, I think a lot of people will be able to relate to it. So for example, you see in some families, um, if, um, if the child is a girl mm -hmm. and the parents wanted a boy, some parents react to this by treating their child as a boy what they understand right as a boy so for example for the father maybe having a boy is like having a friend he can take with him hunting for example and do like what we socially recognize as more boyish activities right and so this is nurture right um she's a girl but she has been exposed to activities and things that usually in society boys tend to do more than girls. And so you see that in many cases, these girls develop a very strong personality um, and even it starts affecting their physiology. Oh, wow. How, right? how so? Not necessarily in a bad way. It just their physiology, the way they stand, the way they express themselves um it tends to have a lot in common with men's physiology wow mm. right 
Um, and these are all unconscious. Why? Because mm. the way we feel, the activities that we do, all of these things, they have an impact on us mm-hmm. as well. Right? And so, for example, certain, certain activities nurture certain qualities. So hunting, it nurtures qualities of courage. So I'm not saying this in, in any context, positive or negative, right? I'm just taking it as, as it is. So it nurtures qualities like courage, um, like um, sharp focus, right? Action. Um, playing with a doll nurtures qualities like, or skills like softness, creativity. So you see, focus, creativity. There are different qualities. So as a result, this girl is going to have a set of skills it's going to affect the way her brain is wired. It's going to affect how she experiences life. It may affect the hormones or other biological constructs in her body Mm. that over time will start showing in her physiology. Mm. Okay, So it's true that the science of biology itself cannot, and no science that is made by man can be completely uh, detached or separated from the context in which it is nurtured. Because let's remind ourselves what science actually is. And some people forget that. Science by definition is an organized body of knowledge that facilitates the development of new knowledge. This is what science is, right? So somebody has organized this knowledge and gathered it, and somebody is using it to build on it, right? And that somebody is people, and people have their own constructs, and therefore, you cannot separate the two from each other. However, uh, this has limitations, so it's not absolute. Because there are certain things that are observable and have no exception and for example if we look at the physiological differences in gender no one can deny that we have two sets Mm -hmm. and whether these two sets are found in one body or not if somebody is transgender for example okay whether they are found in one body or not we recognize that they are a set they are a pair and they do different roles right So this is not something that you can argue out of existence. It's a fact. It exists. Okay? Now call it whatever you want. Call it gender. Call it just organ. Whatever you want to call it, there's a pair. And no one can deny that. And so the differences do exist. Even if you flip it. Right? Even if You call me a man and you call you a woman, which is now the cognitive construct of things, right? It's five o'clock. It doesn't change the fact that you look different from how I look, physiologically. Call me whatever you want and call you whatever you want, right? We are different. There's a difference. And so even if we do agree, and I do agree, that biology, like any science, is to a certain degree affected by the context. It doesn't mean that we have an argument to deny the existence of pairs. Almost everything exists in pair, right? Even morally, everything exists in pairs. No, I, no, I, 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 no, I, I, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I mean, just. I'm sort yeah. of keeping in mind, you know, certain uh, positionalities, and in uh, particular, liberal sort of uh, position and, and critique. No, I'm, I'm very much with you, and and I definitely am of the belief. So, yeah. If I may say, yeah, there's a confusion that maybe is not well uh, accounted for in these discussions. <laughs> Sometimes we confuse concepts and if the concepts are themselves confused then we're starting the argument with with the wrong premise and it's not going to lead anywhere so the first question i would ask her if i were to have a conversation with her would be um 
what do you understand by gender, right? And what do you understand by masculinity slash femininity? Um, and once these are identified, then we can go on with the argument. Because if you are confusing the two, then you will have the tendency to strongly reject the notion of gender. Mm -hmm. So if gender includes all the notions of masculinity which define the roles, right, which then define dignity and freedom in certain cultural contexts, if all of these are packaged in one notion, which is gender, yeah, you know, that makes a good argument to reject the notion of gender. So let's go back and define what gender is. And if we separate gender as a biological fact from the social construct, from the intangible concepts of masculine and feminine, then I don't see a lot of room for confusion because you can have a lot of combinations, right? You can have the male gender being very feminine and vice versa. And so all of these, they exist. No, you're right. And, and, and not to sort of go on and on about this, I'd like to sort of uh, continue from this, but I'll, I'll, I'll just sort of mention that. Um, so Judith Butler is influenced by Michel Foucault and Michel Foucault, whom I, 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 I personally have benefited tremendously from in my own sort of understanding of things. But in any case, a, a major contribution that Michel Foucault does is, uh, one of his major contributions is to say, is to point to the, <clears throat> the sort of complex factors in society at, at, in, in any given historical period, which gives rise to certain uh, you know, sort of realities, what we see as realities, which he significantly mm, problematizes and says, you know, reality, you know, is, as we think of, is, is so significantly shaped by the circumstances that the reality in and of itself ceases to have so much of, a, of an objective quality to it. And, and, and I think Judith Butler is certainly building on Foucault, and, and really this is the outcome, right? To, to say that even gender doesn't exist, right? This is the logical conclusion of that original premise, which I think is problematic. You know, it, it, is, it is problematic. And this is why we're having these discussions, certainly uh, in the West today, in particular, in, in, I mean, it's happening a lot in, in the States and elsewhere, right? That, um, you know, I can't remember who it was recently, but someone, uh, someone was, uh, someone in the sort of public eye, at least, you know, in sort of um, journalistic spheres, uh, uh, was attacked very strongly for saying that, uh, you know, something along the lines that you just said, you know, well, gender is a fact. And they said, well, no, it's not a fact. So now, so this is, anyway, we don't have to dwell on this. I, I mean, I'm on the same page as you, but this is the outcome of that. that so we start to have no facts anymore. And, and then, so then, and then, and this is the sort of, this is how these things start to play out on the world stage, right? And, and I, I, I'm really neither on the left nor on the right. I mean, I, I, I don't take any sort of political, I mean, I, I think uh, life is too complicated to say that one belongs to one camp versus another. But uh, the, the, the way these discussions play out in, on the right versus the left, so the right has, uh, you know, traditionally been more, conservative, of course, and, and has the understanding that gender has reality and biology has a reality, right, which is what the scientific community says and that's the premise that the scientific community works on. And, and it, <clears throat> the right will assign certain traditional, shall we say, roles to the different genders, right, the, the two genders, the male, the male and the female, whereas those, those on the left, right. you know, that they have the, the opposite take, that these things are fluid and uh, but but what I'm hearing from you is that the, there is the possibility of having fluidity. Excuse me. Uh, while in while also understanding that gender is real, right? That the male and the female; these are the two genders through which the world even comes into into being, right? From a deeply metaphysical point of view, right? right. 
uh, this is how life comes into the world for the vast majority of organisms. Uh, there's some asexual organisms, but they're, they're really the, the exception. But um, so uh, so it, the way you're understanding it, the way you're describing it, which is very in keeping, of course, with uh, Sufi metaphysics and Christian metaphysics, and you know, and, and so on and so forth, and Hindu metaphysics that there is room for fluidity within those, within those sort of categories, right? And historically we see this, right? Um, how, how, would you, how would you, and I think we spoke briefly about this um, the first time we spoke, uh, which was uh, regarding the, the uh, and you've already touched upon this today, that the, the roles, um, the more sort of masculine roles can be taken up by women just as the more feminine roles can be take up, taken up by men. And yeah. uh, if, you, if you don't mind my mentioning, I remember you mentioned that in your own experience growing up, your mother had a more sort of, quote unquote, masculine role in, in life and, and your father had a, quote unquote, more feminine role. Would you, would you care to expand on that a little bit just by way of illustration and how that yeah, sort of... Sure. I think it happens in a lot of families and I think uh, the lack of understanding of what is what, you know, the lack of understanding of the nature of things can cause, can be an obstacle if you want to peaceful living. Um, mm. Have learned in, well, the modern world that things have to fit in a certain box and have a certain label on them, right. you know, to, to be, to be okay or not okay. Um, and so I would say, you know, the living experience is one of connection. As long as we are able to connect, whether with ourselves, God, other people, nature, objects, then we know we're alive, we feel alive. And when our connection is impaired, we're, we start feeling less alive, right? So. As long as I am able to connect and through connections take my needs of the masculine and the feminine qualities in life, I should be okay, right? But if I narrow my perspective to just boxes and labels and say, oh, my mother needs to be more like this and my father needs to be more like that, then I'm creating obstacles that actually are not there because my needs are ready to be satisfied. Mm -hmm. And so this is also something that creates this harmony in many homes, right? Mm -hmm. The lack of our ability to deal with the perceived other. Mm -hmm. If I perceive the other through their nature and I just let my nature connect with their nature, mm -hmm. things should be fine, right? So mm -hmm. let's say I, well, I'm not feeling well today. I need somebody to listen to me and just, you know, uh, have some compassion. I need to feel compassion today, right? So I may seek you out, even though you are a um, man, right? Because I know that you have a very strong ability. You have this capacity within you to be compassionate and to give me what I need in that sense. And that's a feminine need that we're talking about, right? right? And... If tomorrow, for example, I need advice in a matter that I'm confused in, and I just need somebody to just nudge me, right? Someone who's going to tell me right is right and wrong is wrong without like, you know, um, without being really easy on me. Just say it, you know. Um, I may go to my girlfriend. Don't come to me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll, I'll be too nice. No. <laughs> right. So, you know, see, if, if I see you, you know, as your own nature and I understand my nature, mm. then it's very easy for me to get this connection and satisfy my needs regardless of the genders around me. But if I'm fixated on the fact that, oh, no, he's, he's a man. I can't go to him to tell him about my problems or maybe ask him, you know, no, he's a man right? I'm going to miss out on a big opportunity just because I'm too focused on your gender, right? And I'm overlooking your nature 
and the capacity and the resources that are within your nature. And so when we are dealing with our parents at home, whether as a child or even like spouses dealing with each other, um, if we can go beyond the socially constructed labels, boxes right, of how a mother should be, how a father should be, and we look at their nature as human beings, then we shall have no problem getting our needs fulfilled because, well, God created all people, and so there is no mistake here, right? So, for example, in my case, my mother has beautiful qualities, right? Then I'm even, like, really grateful that I took on from her. Um, she's a determined woman, she has courage, and she is very perseverant, right? Very lovely qualities, and they worked very well for her, so she's a successful businesswoman, mm. right? But going back to the concept of contraction and expansion, nobody can be contracted and expanded at the same time. Mm. We fluctuate between the states. Right. And so how long we stay in a state of contraction determines how long we stay in a state of expansion. And so if the, the activities that we do during the day or the responsibilities that we take on require that we stay in a state of contraction most of the time, we're not going to have a lot of expansion available to maybe satisfy all the needs for fem feminine qualities. So my father has it in his nature to be extremely empathetic, forgiving, compassionate, even though he's a man, and it never made him less of a man. He's a man by gender, right? But these are qualities and they're beautiful. And they helped me through so much in my life. So I know that if I need unconditional, non-judgmental support, even when I have made the most stupid mistake of my life, I'll go to my father. That's right? amazing. But if I'm fixated on the fact that, oh, no, he's my father, I should just be like throwing rocks with him and, you know, <laughs> and I go to my mother and she's like super busy, you know, with business and stuff and she's not focused, I'm not going to get my need from her. Mm. And I'm going to miss out on the fact that I could get my need from my father and, you know, I'm going to get messed up, right? So this is, this is a real example and a lot of families have this dynamic. Right, because not everything is, you know, the same. And 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 men are different, and when they come together in marriage, they create a different and very unique dynamic at home. And so, understanding the concepts of masculinity and femininity, regardless of the body they sit in, appreciating those as resources mm. and what they can give us. Mm you know, helps us have a more fluid, since you used that word, right? Mm. Helps us have a more fluid relation with everything around us. Mm. I don't know if I've answered your question, but... No, you have. No, that's, that's, that's brilliant. Um, the, the question of polarity that uh, we've touched on, you, you've already discussed, um, I mean, to, to think a little bit about that. So um, someone we both... Uh, I mean, certainly in my case, that's someone I really look up to, and I know. I mean, if if we're coaches, we can't get away from Tony Robbins, right? I mean, he is he is he is the the, the greatest chef in that in that regard, as far as I can tell. Um, so he talks about polarity, right? And he 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 derives from David Dada, uh, who uh, who writes a lot about this. David Dada wrote a uh, book, The Way of the Superior Man, and uh, you know. So Tony Robbins says that in order for there to be attraction in a re relationship, there has to be polarity, right? Um, and, and you know this, uh, right? And we talked about this in our previous conversation, but for the benefit of, of this conversation, uh, if people are watching. Um, so if, if you know, man and woman in a relationship, an intimate relationship, for there to be attraction, one person necessarily has to have, will take on the sort of masculine sort of role, as it were, or sort of inhabit that space more, and the other person will inhabit the more feminine space. And um, so, so, so this is Tony Robbins' point, and, 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 I, and I've thought a lot about this 
and uh, you know it's something I've seen, and I'd like to hear your uh, your take on this. So he argues mm -hmm. that um, you know usually in his experience, heterosexual men their sort of home, as it were, and I, and this is what this is what he says anyway. Their their home is in the masculine, usually that where they they sort of feel most comfortable. And heterosexual women feel most comfortable, usually, in the feminine, more so than in the masculine. This is his, I mean, if I, I mean, I, I know that I'm remembering correctly. <clears throat> and, and what happens in society, in order to maintain polarity, right, and, and because so, social um, dynamics are very complex, of course, and um, in, in, in the workplace, of course, um, usually the energy is masculine. And for people to to succeed in the workplace, women have to take on a more sort of masculine um, yeah. role and energy, as it were. And and very often that energy is brought back home and so forth. So again, to maintain polarity, um, it's it's and these things happen on an unconscious level. I, I've noticed uh, this. I mean, as a coach, I notice these things, and and just as a human being, tries to observe social interactions yeah. I, I notice this all the time in 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 marriages and relationships that one of the two people will and these things are also fluid right because the these sort of dynamics can shift during the course of even a conversation right that um you know it, it, during the course of a conversation a person may shift from regardless of the gender say a guy may shift from being more feminine to being more masculine and and, and, and vice versa um yeah. But, uh, and, and I've also seen, you know, to continue with Tony Robbins, um, at, uh, in his sort of live seminars where he will, he will do these uh, interventions, as he calls them, right? And he'll take a couple that is struggling, right? And, uh, and he will sort of, he will, and it's very obvious, you know, to the audience that the woman, uh, it's, very, it's not an uncommon problem, shall we say that the woman is more in her masculine and the man is more in his feminine and there's tension as a result because at the same time the woman wants the man to man up right and and so so that that like that space has to be created uh, or uh, uh, that space has to be allowed for uh, mm. right so that the so i don't know what's your take on, on all of this you know these things are very complex things right they are uh, very complex that was going to be my first comment actually yeah uh, to make it as simple as possible um but you know if you allow me before i get mm -hmm. into this i just want to i just want to comment on something you said which i yeah. find very interesting and yet very ironic mm. you mentioned the workplace right that mm. the workplace it tends to be very and that's why some women suffer there uh, or have to like make more effort than men because it doesn't come very it doesn't come naturally to them to be masculine all the time right mm. not that we cannot be masculine at all it just doesn't come maybe for easy for us to be masculine for that long right um but interestingly enough this work culture that you're referring to is one based on performance mm. performance 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 right productivity uh did you reach the goal did you finish all the tasks did you deliver on time right you need to see these are very goal oriented, which is a masculine quality. And today, if you follow up with the um, with the corporate world, and it's a trend that's been going on for a while. You and I, as coaches, know this that there is there is this new hype about coaching, right? right. And we know that corporates are paying hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of dollars in investment on coaches and coaching in general has a lot of feminine qualities yeah, in it, right? Yeah, because it's yeah. about listening right, and understanding. Right. And so today they're talking about, there's a lot of talk in the workplace um, and in the corporate world about connecting to the human being and seeing beyond their ability to perform, you know, what motivates them, what makes them tick, and what makes them happy right. at work, right? And let's coach them so that they can improve their performance, right? So it's not just pressure, pressure, pressure. Let's sit and talk to them, listen to them, see how we can, what, what do they say? Empower them, right? 
And so all of these are feminine qualities. And so the corporate world today is catching up actually and ironically mm -hmm. to the reality that masculine alone is not enough. Yeah. We need a balance of the two, right? We need to be on time. We need to be serious. We need to have productivity matrices. That's all good. But at the same time, we need to balance this a little bit. Otherwise, the workplace will turn into a living hell and people will start committing suicide like it happened in MIT for like, you know, many times over and over. Mm. Um, wow. And so I just wanted to point this out. Uh, back to your question of uh, couples. Um, See, I'm going to tell you why this is a complex, very complex topic. Right. Because, because it is. <laughs> yeah, no, but because yeah. It's beyond nature, right? Mm -hmm. You have a lot of nurture here that's mm -hmm. in play. Mm -hmm. And so nurture can mm -hmm. force us to be sometimes in a more masculine place than our nature is. Mm. or vice versa mm. Mm. i'll give you a very simple example try to make it simple so let's say let's say that we do believe in nature right because i know that not everybody believes in that but let's say we do believe in nature which i do right and that nature is in our dna we are born with certain tendencies it doesn't mean we cannot adapt them or improve them or change them or whatever we're born with with a certain tendency it gives us an advantage in that area right so let's say that a girl is born and in her dna she has taken on from one of her parents for example um her tendency to be let's say well sensitive okay um, usually empathetic people ha are very sensitive and at the same time they are very compassionate mm -hmm. right and these are the people who in life if they tap into these resources can be brilliant coaches and mothers or, or like um, I don't want to say mothers they can be brilliant at raising children whether they are a mother or a father mm -hmm. right and they can be brilliant coaches they are people people mm -hmm. right um, and so let's say that a person has this in, in their DNA, right? But then, you know, the way they were brought up, let's say they, ha they had problems at home, you know, parental discord, uh, maybe um, certain types of violence or abuse, and the child was affected. And so they learned to repress. They learn that it's safer for me to repress. Now, if you understand these concepts, you would know that, you know, for the more emotional the person is, the more sensitive they are, the harder it is for them to repress. Because these people tend to express themselves and tend to give mostly in the form of relations, you know, connection. Connection is their strong point, it's their strong hold. And so learning to repress is cutting short what? One of their strongest assets as people. That's like one of their gifts that not a lot of people have, right? And so they grow up. Uh, they haven't learned how to express themselves. And so they are out of touch with their own emotions, yet they do not lose on their sensitivity. But what happens is that, so they are very sensitive, they feel things, but they haven't learned how to express them. They have to be channeled out somehow. So one of the options is that they start channeling them out in forms of aggression. Mm -hmm. It can be maybe, um, you know, just um, verbal, or it can be just um, reaction. So, you know, some people, when they get angry, they start shouting or they start making gestures, you know, it doesn't have to be something like really extreme, like beating somebody, no, but we're talking about aggression in expression, right? Mm -hmm. And so for an observer or from the spouse point of view, if that's a woman, right, her husband's complaint will probably be, well, she's not very feminine. You know, I expect my wife to be the one who has patience, who contains me, not the one who's going to start shouting at me and being defensive all the time. You know, am I right? right? Right. And so this is socially perceived as being a masculine behavior. Mm -hmm. However, if you understand the deepest nature of that woman, she, her nature is the opposite of that. Mm -hmm. 
right? But somehow in her development somewhere, she learned to block. Mm -hmm. And so her behavior is the opposite of her natural tendency. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's a way to heal from that and to go back to our deepest nature and she can you know regain that strength that she already has within her but this is one example of how nature and nurture can be conflicting right mm. um and so our behaviors do not always reflect our true nature this is very very profound thank thank you so much um uh to to that point um uh by way of illustration um containing that point um so in, in my own life experience um i mean family is always complicated right uh, who's the novelist um douglas the canadian uh, novelist douglas copeland is one of his novels is called um all families are psychotic. <laughs> the title speaks up. i love that he's a, he's a brilliant author but uh um, so, uh, and speaking from personal experience, so I, uh, probably not unlike most people, have a complicated relationship vis-a-vis uh, -vis my parents. And um, growing up, um, you know, I, I was closer to my mother than I was my father. That's, you know, not, not uncommon, right? My, my father, in many ways, was and is, you know, sort of distant. Uh, figure and um, in any case, so so they had their issues and discord, and um, I found myself, you know, more and more on my mother's side, defending my mother, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In any case, all of which is to say um, uh, that I unconsciously, and these things happen unconsciously, which I've you know only relatively recently become aware of uh, within myself, like sort of piecing things together, trying to make sense of my own life. Um, I unconsciously said to myself that I would, you know, try to be the opposite of my father. So my father's a businessman. I'm an academic, right? My father's very sort of like this. I'm like, you know, I'm more expansive. I'm creative. I'm a writer, et cetera, et cetera. I'm very empathic. Not that, not that my father isn't, but you know, that, that's not his sort of go-to. Um, and um, so basically, um, so late, so, so all of which is to say that I, um, you know, have over the years cultivated a very strong, what would be described as a feminine side, right? I'm, I'm very sort of comfortable occupying that, that yeah. space. And, and, and at the same time, <clears throat> I've come to also realize that as part of my own evolution and growth as a human being, I have to um, now cultivate the more masculine, which doesn't say that I don't have masculine, like I can, I can be an asshole where need be, not to say that mas being masculine is being an asshole, but like I can, I can really, you know, if need be, come down hard. Uh, you know, contextually speaking, but uh, but that's still an area I need to develop. So, so now actually, I mean, you know, I'm going back to England uh, the uh, next next Monday actually, and the reason behind that is, I mean, my father's not uh, very well, and he's gotten older, and I really need to um, I really need to be by his side and also take over his business, and uh, so so this is part. I mean, this is all worked out, you know, by God's well and grace and um and um uh, and you know so the way i'm understanding it this is part of my part and parcel of my growth yeah um and growing into that masculine dimension more so um anyway that that was i uh, that was all to you know i mentioned all that to you know echo what you just said about sort of family one's sort of past in a very real way priming one or sort of uh sort of creating these tendencies but um but it's an ongoing thing it's an ongoing process and um i think i also mentioned to you before um given okay so so and, and th these are ongoing i mean th these are thoughts i have a lot and i'm still trying to i'm still you know i think one is always learning right one always seeks to better oneself and expand one's horizons um you know, also historically in my own life, um, I, given my, I think, 
again, if we take Tony Robbins's point to heart that, you know, <clears throat> attraction is about polarity, then, um, you know, uh, in order for there to be attraction, I have historically been attracted to and have attracted more masculine, women, <laughs> more quote unquote masculine women. So, so, so that's, that doesn't surprise me. And it's like, okay, but I want to, I want to occupy a more sort of masculine space in my own life. So, so anyway, I'm not asking you to coach me, but you know, that's just an observation. It's, 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 it's a fascinating thing to notice yeah. in one's own life. Yeah. And I, I think the, the fact that humans tend to do that is actually proof that masculinity and femininity do exist because we would not be on the lookout we would not be seeking things unless they exist right? right and so we seek them because they create in us or in our life a feeling of balance right right and so usually to have balance it's implied that you have polarity. Right, right. Because the army balance right, now. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Right. And so we are constantly seeking balance in our life everywhere, mm. right? They talk about work life balance, you talk about well, balance in in your behavior, you know, balance in your impulses. Right. This is where wisdom comes in, right? The ultimate balance, the ability to balance mm. is part of wisdom. And so because balance exists mm, mm. as something that we seek out and something we experience, it means that the polarities do exist. Mm. And without them, there would be no notion of balance, which comes in between the two. And so that's why we tend to seek, you know, whatever creates mm. this balance in our life, right? Oh, and, uh, you know, um, this is another topic altogether, but, um, this is also a reason why many marriages or relationships fail because when we mistake um, our behavioral identity as our deepest nature and we base our decisions on that, mm. eventually we will not get what we want. Mm. Right? And so, and this is what I heard you say, right? Mm. Um, that yes. because your nurture shaped your behavior into a certain feminine place um you needed more masculinity to balance out in your life and you sought that from a partner but then once you were living together you couldn't you cannot get rid of your deepest nature right and yeah. so your nature kept telling you that was not enough you thought you could compensate mm. this way but mm. it didn't work out so there is the masculine and the feminine at different levels and that's why they it's very important to really understand that they are concepts mm. right your behavior can be masculine or feminine your nature can be masculine or feminine your gender can be masculine or feminine and these are not all the same mm. it means something different at each level you know of your constitution and it has different consequences and it leads to different impulses and different decisions. And understanding this helps us understand ourselves a little bit better. Um, and so for me to make the right decision of who is my match in marriage, I have to really be in touch with my nature. Mm -hmm. Right. My, this is, my this is amazing. Thank, Leila, thank you so much. You are you are an incredible breath of fresh air. You are a phenomenally um, wise human being and wise woman. Um, and it's such an honor to to talk to you. Genuinely, it's a deep, deep honor and an incredible learning experience. And I, I really very much look forward to further discussions on this extremely, extremely important topic which can't be reduced to uh, sound bites, which unfortunately many, too many people often like to do. Uh, but thank you so much for this. God bless you. Thank you. I'm humbled, really. Thank you very much. No, and no, thank you for the opportunity and thank you for, um, uh, for this intellectually enriching experience as well. No, I like enjoyed the, the, no, no. And, and the sharing and I appreciate that a lot. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. God bless you. Take care. Talk soon. Bye-bye. You too.